OK, we're going to go over vectors as forces. OK, and we're going to address this question in a moment. But what we're going to do to start is we're just talk about a few ideas in this specific lesson. Um, all they're doing now is we're using forces in terms of application. So we're discussing them, these vectors, in terms of a force. And this is a very simple idea, the same idea if we had vector A and we were to add it to vector B, it would create a third vector, whoops, a resultant vector in our case. Maybe we would name it C, okay? That's all this one is, very similar to what we had done in chapter 6. Equilibrium force is the same magnitude of the original vector. So if this is our vector F, we'll call it, they want to call it a force. The magnitude of this force is the equivalent of the magnitude of the equilibrium force, the only difference is our directions are opposite, right? Instead of having a positive value, we have a negative value. So the direction of that vector is the opposite direction. And finally, if we were to take three vectors and put them together, let's say we had vector A, B, and then C. Essentially, if we follow that pattern of adding them together and we go all the way around back to the exact point we had started, we're in a state of equilibrium. Okay, we addressed all of these ideas in chapter 6. So, using this idea, let's try to see if we can solve this question here. First part says determine the magnitude of F2. All right, well, let's read this question. There are two forces, force 1 and 2, and they act as right angles to each other, which means 90 degrees. The magnitude of the resultant of these two forces is 25 newtons, and the magnitude of force 1 is 24 newtons. So let's try to, whoops, wrong button. Let's try, why does that not work anymore? Let's try to make a picture of these two. So we have force one and force two. It may not be to scale, but we'll call this guy force one and this guy our force number two. So we've created two forces that are at a right angle to each other. Okay. And we know that force two, was it? No, force one was, had a magnitude of 24 newtons. Okay. So the magnitude of force one is equal to 24 newtons. Whether we applied force one on the bottom or force two on the bottom, it doesn't tactically matter. Now we're going to be adding these forces together. So the idea here. The idea here is we're going to take force 1 and add it to force 2. And remember, due to our associative law, it doesn't matter which one we add first. We're still going to get a resultant vector in the end, the same one. So our resultant vector is from where we started to where we ended. In the question, they've told us that this resultant vector has a magnitude, and we'll call the resultant vector just capital F. Okay, Capital F has a magnitude of... 25 newtons. So in other words, this is 25. We know that this is the equivalent vector of force 1, so this has 24 newtons, which means to solve for 2, we've essentially set up a very basic trig question. right? We have a right angle triangle here, so we'll go through our trig rules. We want to know this other side. What trig rule can we use very quickly? What's that? The value of theorem. So remember, they write this as a very complex set of vectors with very different notation. Really, this is just Pythagorean's theorem, this being the hypotenuse. So if we want to set it up very simply, we know that our c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. We have 25 squared is equal to 24 squared. Subtract, force 2 will be known as b. Okay, Not subtract, plus. So we have 25 squared, subtract 24 squared uh, is equal to b if we root all of it. Hey, this is nice. Okay. Should have seen me try that yesterday. 25 squared, subtract. Oh, I don't know if my calculator is good enough to do this on two steps. I think that is. Root 49. Someone double check that for me. Sometimes that calculator is funny if I don't type it in the correct way. Yeah, it's 49. It's 49. Perfect. Okay. So, in other words, our other force here, force 2, has a magnitude of 7 newtons. So we solve this part. The second part says determine the angle between F1 and the resultant. 
and the angle between F1 and the equilibrium. Okay, our angle of F1. This is technically our original F1. Okay, so due to our triangle, we can find this interior angle here and then subtract from 90 degrees. We'll call this interior angle A. So we take A, 90, and subtract the value of A. Or we can find this angle here, and due to our Z pattern, it would be identical to this angle here. It's completely up to you what order you want to solve these in. Okay? What we'll do is we'll do this one. We'll find our internal angle A using a very simple SOCATOR or primary trig ratios. So because we have A, we have opposite and hypotenuse. So we're going to be looking at sine A or theta is equal to opposite is 24, hypotenuse is 25. So we have theta is equal to the inverse of sine 24 divided by 25. This is so smooth. Okay, so let's go 24 divide 25. And the inverse of that function is 73, eh, approximately 73. 73 degrees. So, though not drawn to scale, our A value here is 73 degrees. Okay? Now, it's technically 73 degrees in reference in a counterclockwise fashion to force 2. But in a clockwise fashion to force 1, we would take that value and subtract from 90. So, we left with 17 degrees. So, it is 17 degrees from the resultant. And it is 17 degrees from our equilibrium, unless they're discussing putting it out the complete other way. Okay? If they wanted to do that, we know that all of this here would be 180. All we'd have to do is subtract 17 from that 180 to find the difference. Okay? This question is a bit ambiguous because technically our equilibrium force is an identical vector and we could write it from here. But if we wanted the force to be completely equilibrium, we would just take 180 and subtract our 17. I'll do that in blue here. Whoops, wrong way. 180, subtract our 17 degrees. It's going to give me 163, is that right? Nope. Yes, 163, perfect. Okay. So what I was saying there, if that wasn't that clear, our equilibrium force, the opposing force, if we were to keep this in a steady state, would go from our origin here and just go in the opposite direction with the same magnitude as 25. Okay? So by finding our resultant force, we know that the opposite direction will be 180 degrees from our resultant. Since this is 17, to find in a counterclockwise fashion where F1 is to the equilibrium, this being our equilibrium here, okay, and I'll draw it with a purple line this being our equilibrium. We would just take 180 and subtract the 17 to find out what the angle is to the equilibrium force. Clarify that equilibrium. We have a resultant force here at 25. The equilibrium force will be identical to the resultant force in terms of magnitude. Okay. The only difference is it needs to act in a completely opposite direction. So I'll just put the arrow at the bottom this time. In order to keep us at a state of equilibrium. Okay, so the equilibrium from force 1 will have a very different angle. Now depending on whether they want a bearing, which would be all the way around from due north, assuming that this is north. Okay, So if they want it in a clockwise fashion or a counterclockwise fashion, depends on what angle they were looking for. I went on the assumption that they were looking for the closest angle. Okay, So we know that this was 17 degrees. And to act in a completely opposite force, we need to travel 180 degrees. Okay? So the equilibrium force needs to be going 180 degrees in the other direction from our resultant force. So we take this 180 and we subtract the 17 to find out what the angle is between force 1 and the equilibrium force. So we took 180, we subtract 17, and we got 163. So from force 1, the equilibrium was 163 degrees, and the resultant force was 17 degrees. Okay, and we'll get rid of that blue thing. Okay. 